Jordy Poser. Well, I may not need the mic. Well, thank you uh, for being here. Um, my name is Mike Gastineau. I don't know if, uh, you know, for those who uh, are unaware, I spent uh, 30 years in broadcasting, uh, 22 of them here in Seattle. I was a sportscaster. I was a play-by-play -play announcer. Uh, I primarily, I was a talk show host here in Seattle. I did an afternoon drive talk show from 3 to 7. Uh, from 19, I guess 91 to 93, I was on 10 to noon. 93 to 2012, I was on 3 to 7. In 2012, I felt myself burned out a little bit, and I decided to leave the radio business to pursue other opportunities. And I knew that writing was going to be one of them, because I had always written within the radio business. There are people in radio who don't write, and they just they just do you know what you know they, they, whatever comes into their head. I didn't when I was a talk show host. You didn't write out your monologues or that kind of stuff, except in rare occasions. Uh, but I would write out thoughts. I would try and get things right. So I did a lot of writing. And this goes back to my early days in radio. I loved to write. So I knew when I left radio in 2012, I would do some writing. Uh, and what I've done since then as a freelancer is I've written for various media outlets around the area and around the country. Uh, I've written some for corporate, which I've, I've, I've kind of enjoyed. It's, it's, it's more fun to write for a media outlet because your ego comes into play. You get to put it out there. Hey, look what I wrote for the Seattle Times. Look what I for corporate, you kind of have to take a step back and go, okay, and you just show it to me that this is actually my work. It, it's kind of cool. Uh, and I enjoyed that. I, I, one of my clients was uh, Tattoosh uh, Whiskey and Bourbon. They're local guys who got into the, the distillery craze, and I wrote their website for them and did a bunch of stuff with them, which was a lot of fun. Uh, I also, uh, by the time 2012 had come around, I had authored one book. I co-authored, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But I kind of, in my mind, I thought, I'm going to do I'm gonna do a a book or to, I, I didn't know what it was going to be about but I, I want to write a book I want to see what that's like because the book I had done in 2009 I collaborated with two other writers and yeah I'll tell you more about that in a minute um, I, I wanted to consult companies on communication needs I felt like I was in a unique position to do that that has not been a business I've been able to cultivate as much uh, I'm, I'm amazed um, and I've kind of given up on that end of it but I was amazed at the number of CEOs I would meet uh, who I would say, hey, I'd like to come in and kind of show you some, some social media tricks and some things about the actual, you know, I'm, I'm not a guy who, I, I can't do like SEO, I know what it is, but I mean, that's not where I'm going to help you, but the actual content of the tweet, making sure it's right, making sure the words are right, that kind of thing, and they all almost invariably said, oh, well, we have a kid just out of college handling that for us. And I said, this is like the most, not that I'm against kids just out of college, I was once that myself, but I'm, this is the most important free advertising your company can get, you, know, you ought to have some experience in it. Take advantage of somebody who's been in the business for a while. But, but you know, again, you try to create a market, and eventually the market tells you, you know what, nobody wants this, so nobody wanted that skill out of me. And then I also knew I'd do some freelance broadcasting, and I've gotten back into that more. I was burned out on doing broadcasting every day, but I definitely wanted to keep a foot in the door and still do things. And, and so now I, I do some vacation filling work at KJR, and that's fun. It's, it's like the best of all worlds. I can dip my toe in. It, it, you know what? I, I equate it to, and since I don't have kids, I can't even speak to this, but I equate it to the way people talk about having grandkids. Being a fill-in at radio, I can go in, have a little fun, and just about the time it gets to be a pain in the neck, I believe, and then you won't see me for another two weeks, so it's perfect. So that's what I've been doing since 2012. Uh, and among the companies I've worked with, the Boeing Classic, uh, Copa America, the, uh, the soccer tournament that was here. I worked with the USA Special Olympics team. So I've done a lot of corporate writing and work with those kind of companies and events, and I, I enjoyed that. That was It was fun after years of covering those events as a media person to see them from the inside and to see the amount of work that goes into them. And this is off the topic a little bit, but I'll tell you, for, for a Copa, Copa Americano, I think they called it for the soccer tournament, we had three games here in Seattle about two years ago. They, they had me do, I ran their media accreditation center, which I really had no business doing, but I actually did an okay job at it. Um, one of the things I asked them, they said, we can't really pay you what you're worth. And I said, don't, don't worry about that. Let me sit in on every meeting. I want to see what an event feels like. So I got to sit in, and the thing that, always, that really amazed me, I had to sit in on the security meetings, and you'd be amazed, or maybe you wouldn't be, at the amount of detail that goes into that. I mean, no stone is left unturned. And I mean, we all, anybody in the sports business should think about soft targets 
in the, in the world we live in now. But man, is there a lot of thought and effort and work that goes into making sure everybody's okay. So that's off the topic a little bit. But that's one of the fun things that in a career change, when you say I want to explore new opportunities, suddenly you're free to do those kind of things. And that's what I did. Now, the, the workshop is entitled How to Write the Next Great Sports Book. I wish I knew how to do that completely. And if I did, I probably would be out doing that. But I want to give you as many tips as I can on things that I've learned. And if you're, a, if you're a writer, if you've done some writing, and you're thinking you'd like to do some writing, hopefully you can learn a few things along the way. I'll give you a brief overview of the four books that I've done in my career. I did a book uh, in 2009, and this kind of fell out of the sky. I got an email uh, from a publishing company based in Philadelphia, and they said, we've got this format we've been doing in some cities. It's called the Great Book of, in our case, the Great Book of Seattle Sports Lists. And what they wanted me to do was basically write an anecdotal history of Seattle sports using lists. Who are the 10 greatest Sonics of all time? I write a couple paragraphs of the age one. Who are the 10 greatest Seahawks? What were the 10 biggest upsets? What are the 10 funniest things? On and on and on. And they'd let you come up with one. They had a list of things you could use. They said you also can come up with your own. And I felt almost right away that I was out over my skis a little bit. I knew I could write, but I didn't have as good a grasp of Seattle sports history prior to my arrival in 1991. So I called up my friend Art Teal, who was writing for the Post Intelligencer at the time, local columnist, and now has Sports Press Northwest. Art brought Steve Rudman, who is a local behind the scenes writer who's just a research junkie. He said, We need to bring him in. And so the three of us wrote this book together. So my first book was a collaboration, and I learned an awful lot from Art and Steve. And it, it, uh, we published the book in 2009. Uh, almost the day after it was published, I was like, I want to do it on my own now. I know what I'm doing. I want to try one on my own. So now I'm working in radio, and a couple of years go by. When I get out of radio in 2012, uh, I, I got this notion that I could write a book on how the Sounders were launched in the MLS. I knew all the key players, uh, uh, the, the business side of it, and I, I thought it was a fascinating story, and I think it was, and I think I wrote a pretty good book about it. And that's two different things I'm talking about. I, I always tell people, hey, this. This book I'm working on is a sensational story. And they go, well, you've got a big ego about yourself. I go, no, 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 no. I'm saying the story's sensational. We'll see if the book's any good, but the story's great. And that's a big key we'll talk about is identifying the story. So Sounders FC, Authentic Masterpiece, I self-published. Uh, it came out in 2013. I refer to it as a regional bestseller. Uh, and I challenge anyone to prove me wrong. Uh, we have sold over 12,000 copies. The typical business book, and it was a business book, Typical business book in the in the country, uh, the average sells 4,000. So 12,000 was pretty good. I've also sold another almost thousand in Brazil because I had a, I had a my wife and I were in the middle of moving. This is an example sometimes of when something falls out of the sky. Sometimes it really is something good. We were in the middle of moving and I get an email saying, uh, Mr. Gaston, my name is um, I can draw a blank on the guy's name. Gabriel Gabriel Goldman. My name is Gabriel Goldman. Uh, I work for a small publishing company in Sao Paulo, Brazil. We are going to exclusively publish soccer books, and we'd like an American title to put in our catalog to make us look bigger. And we'd love to do a deal with you. And my first thought, as I'm in the middle of moving, was some friend of mine has gone to a great length to punk my ass and to make me look like a complete dope. Because at this point, all I'm thinking about is this book. I'm thinking, and I'm like, oh, everybody got me. So I'm like, I'm not going to worry about this. And about a week later, I said, I, go, I better reply to this guy. Well, lo and behold, it really is Gabriel Gobreth of Sao Paulo, Brazil, who's become a terrific friend. And they published the book. They translated it into Portuguese and did a deal with me. So that was a book that I, I had a lot of fun with, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very proud of, of how it turned out. Uh, the third book I did was a collaboration. Uh, it's called At the Edge of Life and Search. But you know what, actually? I hauled these things down here. I might as well show them to you. See, an experienced guy would have gotten these out first. But since it's an intimate gathering, I feel like I can do this. And I'll be happy to just send them around to you if you'd like, so you can kind of take a, a look at them. The Portuguese book is on top, in case you're fluent in Portuguese. Um, so the third book I did was called At the Edge, Life in Search of, uh, of a Challenge. And that was a, uh, a guy who lives across the highway from me on Whidbey Island named Steve Trafton. Steve is, for lack of a better word, an eccentric. And for lack of another better word, an eccentric billionaire with a B. Steve's got a ton of money. And he's lived a really amazing life. And he and I sat down and he paid me to originally co-write his biography. As we get the deeper we got into it, he fancied himself a writer. 
I'm a writer, we all have egos, I think I'm a better writer than Steve, but Steve says, I want this book to be in my voice. So he allowed me to do the first draft. He rewrote some of it, he used some of what I have, but in the end he said, look, it would mean a great deal to me if just my name was on the cover. That was fine by me, he paid me and we had a deal and, and he, he, did, he treated me fine. And he thanked me, he was very generous in his praise in the, uh, in the acknowledgements. I wish my name was on it, just because I'm, I, I think it's a cool story. But in the, in the end, it was, it was his, and, and he's out. Uh, I think he's walking across Luxembourg now. This guy, he's an Arctic explorer. Uh, he owns a land speed record for Ferraris at Bonneville in Utah, the Salt Flats. He uh, was a banker who sued the United States government in the Supreme, in a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court, and he won. He won like a huge judgment from them. Uh, he's, he's like Walter Mitty. You know, he's in, he's, becomes the protagonist in a lot of weird stories, or like, uh, who am I thinking, Forrest Gump. He just ends up in a lot of interesting places. So Steve was a, a neat guy to sit and work with. Uh, my fourth book is actually coming out this year. I'll expect all of you to buy several copies just in time for the holidays. Uh, it's called Mr. Townsend and the Polish Prince. And this is a book that's been a tremendous, tremendous fun piece to write. Uh, Mr. Townsend is Nelson Townsend. Uh, he was the athletic director at Delaware State College back in 1980 when Delaware State came out to the West Coast and played Portland State in a football game in Portland State with a young coach named Mouse Davis and a young quarterback named Neil Lomax beat Delaware State 105 to nothing. And Delaware State was committing the one, my friend Mike Silver always says there's one sin in college sports. Because there's four ways you can play college sports. You can cheat and win, that's okay. You can play fair and win, that's probably the best. You can play fair and lose, there's nobility in that. You can't cheat and lose. If you're cheating and losing, you are doing it wrong. And Delaware State was both cheating and just getting drilled. So they had a huge problem, they had had all kinds of scandal in the program. Nelson Townsend was their athletic director. Delaware State College is uh, uh, what's called an HBC, Historic Black College or University. It's, it's um, you know, HBCUs came out of the Morrill Act after the Civil War. Uh, and there were, there were two things that they were doing. They were trying to educate people rurally. They were trying to have these state ag colleges teach farming, teach ranching, teach you know manufacturing, kind of almost like a Votech type school. Uh, and they also said, we, we, you know, as a nation, we are freeing a bunch of people. We've got to give them an avenue for education. So that's what that's and and what happened was they gave these land grant universities to all these states. And in a lot of cases, the, they, they took the land grant, they said, this is great, and then they immediately barred black students. So the whole point of this is, when we, you know. So then in 1892, they said to any school that had accepted the land grant from the US, they said, you have to either admit uh, black students or, or tell us why you're not. And most of the states, to get around that, immediately formed a black-only college. That's where historic black colleges came from. You know, People who maybe either aren't enlightened or don't want to think about it go, well, why do they have to have their own college? And well, they have to have their own college because they couldn't get into other colleges and they had to start one so they could educate themselves. And uh, so, you know, that's where the historic black college network came from. So, Mr. Townsend is Nelson Townsend. He's the athletic director. He has to hire a new football coach. Uh, the coach he hired was a guy named Joe Perzik, who was the Polish prince in our title. Uh, Joe was the first ever white head football coach at an all black college. It's in 1981 when there were only two black head coaches in the entire country outside of the black college network. So Joe's hiring sparked no shortage of controversy. There were a lot of people really upset saying, look, this is the black college network. Why are we giving a position of leadership to a white person when the quote unquote white colleges never hire a black person as a head coach? So Joe took a lot of heat. Nelson took even more heat for hiring him. And so this story is one that's been told a lot of times, but I don't think it's been told from the perspective of a, of a white man who walked into a, a college uh, with, a, with a football team of predominantly black athletes, some of whom turned on him, some of whom didn't, and it's about the waters that he had to navigate uh, to get through all this. It's a, it's a really neat story. It's coming out on December 15th, most likely self-published, although we're shopping around in, uh, to, to a couple of agents in New York, so we're getting kind of tight on time to get a deal done with them. But anyway, it's a, it's a neat story, and I'm, I'm really proud of it, and it was uh, it was fun to write. So those are the four books I've done. So I, you know, hopefully that gives me a little bit of credibility in how we talk about this. Now, you know, again, I, I kind of laughed when I saw the How to Write the Next Great Sports Book, you know. And this could be applicable to any book. I'm not sure how you write a great book. 
you know, but, but I'll give you a few tips on how I think you can write a book that you'll be proud of and, and, and how you want to define great then I guess comes next. The, the process of it, for me at least, and I think this is pretty true for anything, is you have to identify a story. And that can be looking or it can hit you. You know, I, I have a lot of friends who are musicians and they talk about writing songs. And almost all of them say the best songs hit you. They, 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 and I can't grasp what they mean. I don't have any musical skill. But that they just come to you like the way that they write down stuff. There's the famous story about the, the opening riff for Satisfaction. You know, Rolling Stones came to Keith Richards in a dream. He heard it in a dream. He woke up. He, had a tape, he always had a tape recorder. He turned the tape recorder on. He, he, he kind of sang what he thought the riff, and that's the riff to Satisfaction, one of the most famous riffs in music history. So they, they come to you in weird places. I, you know, I think stories can be that way, too. Uh, they can kind of come out of the blue, or it might be something you know about, or something you read about, or something you hear about. Uh, but identifying the story that will become your book, it sounds, it sounds ridiculous. That's obviously, that is job number one if you're going to write a book. You have to think to yourself, what, what, what am I going to do? How am I going to find the story? And I think there's, there's three elements that you'll know you've found a story that, that can work for you. The first one is, it has to interest you. Again, it sounds basic, but in all honesty, otherwise, writing is a laborious process. Or writing a book is, you know, at a minimum, it's a year-long project. And you will get sick. I can read to you passages of my new book because I've memorized it. Now, there's, there's parts of it where you almost get tired of dealing with it. So make sure the topic interests you. You know, that's a big, big key. Will it interest other people? You have to hope so, but you, know, you don't know until it's out there. But make sure it's a story that interests you. Make sure, to a certain extent, that it's a story people don't know a lot about. You know, that that's, you know, that and, and that can be a lot of different things. There can be a lot of things that have happened over the course of time in sports where people might know the surface of it, but do they know how deep it is? You know, I'll give you a good example locally, and, and I don't know, uh, you know, if you remember, yeah, it's been 23 years ago now, um, but when Edgar Martinez hit the double to beat the Yankees in the, in the 95 playoffs, there are so many little sub-stories to that, and I've, I've thought about maybe someday doing a book on that. There's an awful lot of interesting and weird and crazy stuff that happened in the eight days around that series. So that's a story that everybody knows about, but not everybody knows all the details. So that's what I mean when you say, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good example. I was thinking this afternoon I couldn't come up with one, but there are other stories that people kind of know everything about. You know, I, I'll tell you, like, would I do a book on the Seahawks winning the Super Bowl? I'm, I'm not sure there's a whole lot left that people don't know about. Maybe in 20 years you might. But I just don't know that there's a, a whole lot left that people don't know about. So make sure it's a story that's got some depth in that you And that you find yourself, like a good friend always says, does it have a huh factor? And what the huh factor is, you're reading about it and you go, huh, I, I didn't know that. Huh, that's kind of interesting. And as you, as you learn, and that was what this Delaware State story was to me. I've known Joe Brzezicki for years, he and I are old friends, and he always had told me, well, this story would make a great book, and you know, you hear that from a lot of people. Well, as I started talking to him, and I started doing some research, I'm like, wow, this, he's right, this really is, there's a lot of huh here, like, no, I didn't know that, that's kind of cool. So make sure it's got some huh factor. And then I have found, in, in, in my writing, in my last three books especially, the great book of Seattle Sports List, I kind of knew a lot of that, and art plugged in the gaps I didn't, just because I, you know, I kind of have to know Seattle Sports history to be a talk show host. I love it when I find a story that I don't know a lot about. I'll use the Sounders book as an example. I knew the Sounders story, and I kind of knew how it all come together, but I'm not a soccer aficionado. I like the sport, but I don't live and die with it. I think that allows me to write a better book. I think when you sit down and you can legitimately ask questions that you don't know the answer to, you will do a better job interviewing your subjects. You know, if you already know everything, and you know, we're all guilty of this, and you start talking to somebody, you want to tell them everything you know right away, that, you know, I, I'm not sure how deep your research will go. Uh, this Delaware State book, I've talked to Joe enough over the years that I knew a few things, but then I got into it, I'm like, God, I didn't know this, I didn't know that. Okay, I want to learn more about this. So those are three things. Uh, to me. Make sure it interests you. That helps a lot. Uh, make sure it's a story that hasn't been told a lot. If there's five other books on it, you may want to back off. And, and boy, if you can hit the home run and find something that you don't know a lot about, where you're learning every step of the way. Uh, the book At the Edge with Steve Trapton, that was really a cool thing for me because so much of it is about Arctic exploration. I'm here to tell you, the next time you're bored, 
look up some of the great Arctic, not Antarctica, and Antarctica's got some great stories too, but the Arctic exploration, Sir John Franklin. Uh, the Sir John Franklin story is amazing to me. I, just, I love learning about this. I knew nothing about it, but Sir John Franklin was commissioned, a while since I thought it was from, from England, and he's, uh, they want him to find the Northwest Passage. They are dying to find a way across the Arctic Ocean to get their goods to and from Asia, because it'll be a lot faster than going all the way down around either Africa or South America. And the Panama Canal's not built yet. This is in the 1800s. Sir John Franklin, they take, I think it was three ships, two ships, and like 80 men. And they're gonna go find the Northwest Passage. And they get caught in sea ice in the North Arctic for three years. These, they, have, they have documented evidence these guys, these, these poor bastards somehow survived in the Arctic for three years. And then, they all ended up dying. I mean, little by little, they finally got the best of it. Anyway, that's an example of like, to me, when Steve took, Steve knows that story off the back of his hand and didn't even interest him anymore. I'm like, Steve, slow down. This is fascinating what these guys went through. And Steve is kind of an expert on the John Franklin. So that's an example of finding something within a story that, hey, I don't know about. I'm going to enjoy doing the research on this. And that then fuels your writing. So those three things there. Uh, you, you've hit on an idea. You've decided what you think you might want to do. Um, probably, and, and this, this, the next part, you can build an outline at that point and decide how you want to do it, or you can start doing your research. I don't know that there's a right or a wrong way to do that. But if you decide to do your research, uh, you know, start identifying how people fit into the story. Uh, identify the people that are uh, around and who you can contact. You'd be amazed how easy it is to find me. It's no lie, man. Nobody can hide anymore. The internet. I found people for this Dell State book that nobody had talked to in 30 years. And one guy kind of dropped out of society and started a charismatic church in Mississippi. And he's a great guy. And, and it's a, you can find just about anybody. So you find this story that you like, and you identify the people that are in it that are important, and you start looking and seeing if you can contact them. As you learn how people will fit in, you'll find out that, let's say there's 20 people you want to talk to for a book, some of them will be very quotable. Some of them will be like, and you'll know right away when you're interviewing them, you know, this guy's got great stories, and he's funny, and he kind of gets what I'm doing, and, and you just like, so some of them will be like, Others might not be as quotable, but they'll be great on background material. Sometimes you find some that are both. But sometimes you might find a guy who doesn't necessarily, isn't the greatest storyteller, but is able to give you some background on something. And, and kind of just educate you on the story you're working on. And these are people that end up getting thanked a lot of times in the acknowledgments. You know, I didn't get to use a lot of their quotes, but thank you for your time because you helped me understand the story. Um, they'll you'll run into some people that may ask if, if you're going to pay them. And it's a personal decision, but the answer is usually no. You know, when you're writing a book, you're going into debt. You know, unless you get an advance. And if you get an advance, that's good for me. Even if you get an advance, it's not enough that you want to start giving $100 bills to everybody to talk to you. So the answer to, you know, are you getting paid? I always have, and I've only had this happen a couple times. There's actually only one person who refused to talk to me unless I paid him, and that was uh, Freddie Unberger. The uh, Sounders guy from was he Sweden, I think, and I'd love to talk to him. He's a really interesting book. But his agent said, "Okay, he wants total approval of everything you write." So I'm not giving him that, and he wants to be paid. And I said, "Well, I'm really not giving him that." And we went back and forth, and I, I wrote the book without him. His life went on just fine, so did mine. It's not a huge deal. But if you start paying people for stories, then you know you're, you're going to be broke, and you're going to have to sell a lot of books just to make up for that. Um, newspapers you know, are incredible sources of information. There's a website called newspapers.com that like, I'm addicted to now. It's just, it's, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of papers archived online. It's not cheap, it's not crazy expensive, but it's like it's kind of maybe 75 bucks for six months. So it's a little price, but boy, oh boy, when you get in there and you can just dig up any story you want. And, and you, you, if I find myself like it, it slowed down my research a little bit on the Dell State book because I'd be reading and I'd go, hey, look, the 1983 pennant race, and I'm reading stories about what you're doing. I'm like, ah, you know, stop it. Get back to what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, so newspapers, it's funny because we're at a time when newspapers obviously are not as powerful and influential as they used to be, although it's interesting to me, without getting political, that as much as our president hates the media, he's done more to fuel the newspaper business. I mean, he's, trust me, the newspapers, 
I don't know how to stand editorially, but in the business room, they're like, hey, you know, four more years of this, then we'll just keep selling papers because he's a fascinating character and people want to write and read about it. Newspapers are in a little bit of a decline, but online and old microfiche, that kind of thing, they're tremendous uh, uh, sources for you just to get to fill in the basics of a story that you're looking at. Uh, and, and again, just about anything that you would think of story wise, there's some old newspaper articles or something about it where people have commented on it. So uh, uh, you'll want to use that. Uh, another, so, so begin research, begin contacting people, think about how you're going to tell the story. Uh, the interview process is next. That's a natural thing for me. I was in broadcasting my whole life. I love sitting and bullshitting with people. It's not as easy for some people, but it's actually kind of a fun thing. Again, if you're interested, one thing to keep in mind, if you're interested in this story, I have yet to meet the person who doesn't want to talk about themselves. When you call somebody and say, hey, were you the guy that did this? Yeah, well, I'm working on a book, and I'd like to talk to you about it. Most people go, yeah, I'd love to talk about myself. Who doesn't want to do that? So it's fun. So, so you set up your interview process. When you do this, uh, be sure you have enough time blocked out. Ideally, you'll meet with people in person. That's not always possible. And in the age of Skype, and, you know, they're still, I'm not a landline. I'm like the last guy with a landline in my home, but it, it sure comes in handy when I want to do interviews. With phones, you know, there's ways to, to, to do the interviews where you don't have to be in person. You want to record every interview that you do, and you want to save those recordings, and you want to say to the, what's your name, sir? Jose. Jose, uh, is it okay with you if I record this conversation? And then he's going to say yes, and you want to have your recording going while that's on there. That way, just in case, Jose comes back around and says, I didn't give you permission to talk to me. He said, no, you said right here, it's okay if I talk to you and record. So every conversation you begin with someone, and people expect that, is just say, is it okay with you if I record this? And they'll say yes, and then you're off to the races. Um, you'll have done your research beforehand, so you'll have the five or the 10 or the 20 things you want to talk about. I try not to necessarily write out questions. Just jot a word down. You know, jog your memory. By now this thing will be deep in your mind and you'll know what you want to talk about. And get into a conversation. You know, if it's question answer, it can it can kind of slow down. Try to get into a conversational flow with them and, and, and build it through that. So make sure you get enough time block, jot down the things you want to talk about. Now uh, make uh, there's a couple schools of thought here. I'm not an old style print reporter. Print reporters are amazing. They can actually write while they're listening to you. I don't know how they do that. I have to kind of look at the person and listen to them. I might make a note on a follow-up question that I want to ask, that's something that they said. But to me, it's really critical to listen to what the person's saying, because oftentimes the next question is in what they're telling you. And they might be telling you something amazing. I didn't want to know that. So you, you, you can really work on your listening skills. And that's, that's easier said than done for all of us, because among the great things social media has done for us is it's turned us all into goldfish. Our goldfish, the animals have like a seven-second memory and somebody said that's why they swim around in circles forever and not go crazy because they only have seven seconds of memory space and they're tiny little wolfers. We're all turning into that. You know, we're all distracted so easily. Really work on clearing your mind and sitting down and listening to the person who's giving you this time because it's valuable. It's the lifeblood of your book is what they're going to tell you. So uh, now we get to a point here where I differ from a lot of writers. There are transcription services that you can hire. And generally, a lot of times it's just college kids, a lot of English majors in college sign up to do this. So you interview me for your book and we talk for an hour and a half and then you send the tape off to this person, you pay them and they send you back what was said. Partially because I think I'm clinically insane and partially because I think it helps me write better, I do my own transcribe, which is insanely time consuming and insanely difficult. But I just think it helps me write the book and I build quotes as I'm going through that. So writing for me almost becomes an exercise in copy and pasting. So a lot of the work I'm doing is transcribing the interviews and then I get back and I'm like, wait a minute, this guy said something about this and that quote I can pull out and put in there and it'll plug in great. So transcribe, and it's a personal thing. Most writers would laugh at what I just told you and they'd say I use a transcription service because I send it off and these people are geniuses at it and they get it done in a third of the time it would take me and it doesn't cost that much. So it's a personal choice. Okay, now we're on to writing the book. You've, you've identified your story, uh, you've built your outline, uh, you've, you've, uh, you've done your research, you've got all these great, uh, there's a, you know, your, your office will look like a beautiful mine. You'll have stuff stuck everywhere and, and, and piles of papers and this and that. Now you're going to build your book. 
Uh, and, and the first thing you have to do, this is something you learn to do as a kid, and finally it's coming back to help. Build an outline. Build an outline of what you think your book is going to look like. And this, as I said earlier, this, I don't know if there's a correct order for what I'm telling you. You could build the outline the instant, the minute you decide on the story. Okay, here's what I think the outline is, and then go do your research. But at some point, you're going to build an outline. And if it's just like it is a kid, you know, you're like, all right, what well, am I going to have? 10 chapters, okay, here's what each chapter is going to be about, okay, here's what I think I'll explore in each chapter, and just do it that way. Big thing when you're building an outline, no surprise here, is don't get married to any one idea. Don't get married because you will get into it, and and, and if you're like, oh, this has got to be here, and you go, no, no, actually, now that I've done some writing and some working around, this might be better over here. Or this thing here that I thought was a big part of the story, taking it out. It doesn't fit. So be open to those kind of things as you're building the outline. Editors that you work with them may make that suggestion. But you'll also see, you'll get into something and go, you know, this is a funny story, or it's a great story, but it just doesn't fit this particular book. Or it doesn't fit right now, I'm going to save it. Don't ever throw anything away. Put it in a file of stuff to look at when you've got most of the draft done. You can look and see if there is a place to fit it. But be open to changes within how you look at the manuscript. Um, if you can write the book in order from first word to last, congratulations, you've been able to do something other than any writer's ever been able to do. So in other words, you get an idea, you get a thought, so write it. Get it done. Don't worry about where it's going to fit in the book. You'll, you'll figure out where it fits later. And you'll figure out what the lead of your book is, what the first chapter is going to be about. You want to hook people. The first chapter's got to be good. Steve and I went round and round, and we originally were going to open the book with him. He's got a great first-person account of surviving an avalanche, and we were for sure. And then he changed his mind and wanted to put something else in there. And again, because he and I were collaborating, I had to take a step back eventually. But you want something like that. You want your avalanche story, something good. But for my for my book on Delaware State football, we start with a hundred five to nothing loss. That's going to hook a sports fan. And you know, that's the hundred five to nothing. That's crazy. That never happens. So it's a, it's a, it's a good way. Uh, and, and you'll discover that as you get in. You'll find the one thing, and, and again, it's a difference between, okay, what will hook the reader in versus what's the big climax point? What's the point where, you know, you get over the falls a little bit? That's, that's the two different things. Just be open to arranging and rearranging things within the framework of the book because there's, it will present to you opportunities to do just that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, collaborating versus working alone. Um, uh, I prefer working alone, although three of my four books have been collaborations, so you know sometimes you can't necessarily pick that. Um, working alone has the obvious advantages. You don't have to run every idea past another person. You go with your gut. You decide what you think. And you've got an editor. You're never truly alone. You've got you know people who may look at it and, and, and take a look at it and see what they think. But working alone versus having to run everything by people is um, that's what I prefer. The collaborations, like my collaboration with Steve, was frustrating in the end because he wanted to kind of take control of it, but it was fine because he had paid me. And look, that, that's a, in, in, that's, a, it's, it's my favorite line in the movie Boogie Nights when he introduces him to the colonel and says, he pays for our movies to be made. That's a very important part of the process. Getting paid is, is, is worth something. You know, your integrity is one thing. I'd rather have my name on the front of that book, but the fact that he paid me and lived up to his end of the deal, that's, that's as important to me as that. So. Um, from a collaborative standpoint, that can be frustrating. This new book that I just wrote, the guy I worked with, I had a great time with, and he really he let me. We had a little bump early. And we really had to have kind of a come to Jesus meeting. I said, "Look, do you want me to do this or not? Because you can't, you know, we can't change everything I write. You know, we have to at some point we have to settle on what we're doing and move forward. And and that was a, that was an important part. So collaborations, you have to stand up for what you believe in in your writing, but you also have to have some give and take. I had to collaborate with Joe on this book about Delaware State because he's the primary character and I needed him to give me these stories. And his name on the front of the book will sell copies of the book out east because he's pretty well known out on the east coast as a football coach. So, uh, you know, each, each way has its benefits. I prefer to work alone. But a collaboration, and it can be a fun way to get into it your first time. If you come up with this great story, someone tells you, say, have you ever heard of this story? And, and it's their story. You, go, you know, what if we work together on this? And I could. I could write it, and, and, and then they look through it and tell you, hey, this is good or this isn't good, that kind of thing. So, um, I mean, to be honest, I'm not even sure where I was going with this point. But collaborating versus working on two different ways of approaching the beast, 
And, uh, and the working alone is nice because you're on your own. Collaborating can be fun because it's like being in a band. It's like, I guess the difference between being a solo singer and being in a band. You're, you're having to compromise and create something that hopefully you'll be proud of. Now, self-publishing versus publisher. Um, I've had one book done, traditional publishing, that was my first one, and I've done three now that will be self-published. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, the, the nice thing about a publisher is, A, they usually give you an advance. Uh, they handle it. They handle the marketing, they handle the distribution, they handle the services, the putting the book together, laying it out, getting the cover, paying for the photos. They do all of that. So they give you an advance, they do all the work. Uh, you know, what's not to love? Well, one thing that's not to love is if, if your book comes out of the blocks and doesn't sell a lot early, they abandon you. You're on your own. They pull all the marketing money and you're on your own and, and, and you have to handle all of that other stuff. Um, the other thing is, it is an impossible business to get into. The, the, the publishing business is, you know, it, 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 they're having so many problems right now. I know fiction in particular, like publishers don't even want fiction right now, unless you're John Grisham or you know, somebody who's got a real track record of, of producing good fiction. They want nonfiction. That's why we're hoping this Dell State story kind of catches on. They want you know, uh, story, you know, real life stories, that kind of thing. But it's hard. You go to a publisher, and I'd say to them, hey, well, I've got this one book, the great book of Seattle Sports List. We sold about 6,000 copies. Challenger's book, I've done about 13,000 copies. I'm not sure how many Steve has sold at the edge because I'm not in on the business end of that. And a publisher would just yawn. Well, you don't have any track record. Why would I give you any money in advance to write a book? So the traditional publishing side can be tough. You need to know somebody. You need to have a good idea. But if you look in with them, they're going to handle a lot of this stuff. You don't have to worry about this stuff. You worry about writing the book and getting it to them. Now, the nice thing about self-publishing is with all this stuff, so as we talk about, they'll handle marketing. Well, you can handle marketing. That's what social media is there for. There's all these different channels now where you can promote what you're doing. So there is an avenue for marketing that didn't used to be there. Distribution. There are self-publishing companies. There's a ton of them. Amazon owns one called Create Space that just merged with, uh, I didn't merge with Amazon, just kind of bought them out. And they're calling it Kindle Publishing. And I think it's going to be the same thing. They've taken away some of the services. But basically, there are self-publishing companies now where they'll walk you through and you can, you know, as fast as you can get a book done and send it to them, they can have it published for you. And they use uh, the, the good ones, including Amazon, use a thing called print-on-demand technology, which I, I'm blown away by this, but I can get on my phone right now. If we decided we wanted to buy 100 copies of my Sounders book and ship them to Jose's house and we're going to have a big party, I could, I could have them there like in three days. They don't even exist now, but they go to a factory in South Carolina. They, they've got all the templates there. They print them. Because traditional publishing, that's been their problem, is they, you know, they have to kind of guess how many books are going to be sold. And, and they, you know, so that's how you end up with, you know, God, I've got 4,000 books here that I didn't sold. I've got like 20 copies of my Sounders book left. And if I needed another 50, I could call up order. So the print-on-demand thing for self-publishing is good. So self-publishing is great in that they, they have everything. They will help you lay the book out. Uh, they will, they will uh, uh, walk you through the steps of getting everything done. They'll get the cover design for you. Uh, again, you can do the marketing through social media. They have marketing things that they can do for you to help. So really, there's nothing you can't do with self-publishing versus, say, what a publisher would bring you, with the notable exception. A publisher will give you an advance, and then look, look, if a publisher walk in the door right now and said, I want to give you I don't know what they give. That's I'm getting twenty thousand dollars for the rights to Mr. Townsend and Polish Prince, and we'll handle everything. You don't have to worry about marketing. I would take that immediately. I won't lie to you. That would be. I might take less than twenty grand just to get the, the headaches of it off my plate. But the do-it-yourself kind of side of this is fun. It was fun with the Sounders book. I had a big advantage there. I was in Seattle. I had a radio career for twenty years. I knew I could market this book with my name. That, that doesn't happen all the time. Like with this Dell State book, I don't know how many books we're going to sell out here, a book about an East Coast football team. We'll see. But uh, So publishing can reduce the headaches and can give you an advance. But the royalty also, like I, I think for the great book of Seattle Sports List, I think I made a dollar and three cents for every book that we sold. For self-publishing, through Amazon, if you go to Amazon right now and buy my book, which you probably should do, uh, I'll get like seven dollars and nineteen. I get like seven times what a publisher would pay. If 
if I wanted to sell you that book right there, that book cost me $4 because I get a wholesale deal. I don't know if wholesale is the right word there, but I get a deal from them when I buy the book because I'm the author. And, I, and, and the list price is $19.95, and I say, hey, I'll give it to you for 15 bucks. But I just made $11 on that book. So, so the do it yourself, if you got kind of a little head for business, and trust me, I have a little head for business. I'm not a great businessman, but I've had to learn. The do it yourself aspect of it is kind of fun. So, like, if you do a book and you say, okay, I'm going to go to this, this men's club, this women's club, this, some club that's interested in hearing about my book, and there's 50 people at this thing, and you bring in 50 books and you pay $4 for each one, so you've got $200 worth of inventory, and you sell each of them for 20 bucks, you walk out, you know, you feel pretty good about yourself. So that, you know, whereas if you have a publisher, the nice thing about having a publisher is the same club hires you, you give your publisher name, they call public, the publisher sends the books, they send people to sell them, you never see any money, and then later they send you about a dollar for each book or something like that. So, and, and that's against your advance until you get there. I'm kind of rattling on a little bit about this, but self-publishing versus publishing, there are advantages to both, and there's tons of information on the internet, obviously, about this tool you can read and research. In the end, unless you're extremely lucky, which I wish luck upon you, uh, you probably have to think about self-publishing because that's just a, it's just an easier and more reasonable way to go before a publisher says, "Ah, it to be you. Why am I going to get in, in, involved with you?" Unless you've got the greatest story ever. Um, so, marketing distribution services both available through either means. It's just a matter of whether you want to do it yourself or you're lucky enough to have somebody do it for you. Uh, in the end, and I'd love to take some questions too. We've got a few minutes. I wanted to share a little bit. I'm assuming all of you have done some writing or you're interested in doing some. And you probably have some things you've written that you're really proud of. And you have some things that you've written that you think are just crap. And that's natural. No, it's like anything in life. If you've written 20 things, naturally, one of them is going to be the greatest thing you ever wrote, and one of them is going to be the worst thing you ever wrote. But here's the thing. Learning to be self-critical is important. Learning to recognize, hey, this is crap when I'm writing, this isn't going anywhere, and being able to, to either erase it, delete it, save it maybe, but put it in a file you only look at it once in a while. Uh, but don't, when, when you publish something, and even, I'm talking even if you, let's say you write a poem and put it on Facebook, anything you publish, my, my sister-in-law does this a lot and it drives me nuts, she's a pretty good writer, and she'll put stuff online and she'll go, this isn't really very good, but here it is. And I finally called her. I mean, she doesn't have a lot of self-confidence, and I'm imbued with an insane overabundance of self-confidence beyond my actual life skill set. But I'm confident in what I do. Uh, and I told her a story, and I like to tell this to anybody who wants to create. Don't publicly criticize yourself. Let other people do that. Because if you worry about the things that you're doing wrong, you're going to struggle. And there's a great story I'll give you as an, as an example. 1976. Maybe 75. Uh, the band, the Ramones, the New York City punk band, the Ramones, they were playing their first shows ever in London. And they're over there, and they're a big sensation, but they're a small do-it-yourself act, so they're, they're doing it themselves. And they get their van that they've rented with all their equipment, and they get to the club where they're playing, and it's 3 in the afternoon or something, and their show is at 8 o'clock. And they start unloading their equipment. And there were a couple of kids there, a couple of years younger than them. The Ramones are pretty young at this point, but these kids are maybe 17, 18 years old. Ramones are in their 20s. And they said, hey, if, if we help you carry your equipment in and set a few things up, could we get tickets to the show? And they said, yeah, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? So they're kind of stuff. And Joey Ramone, the singer, he gets interested in these kids. He's like, you guys, you know a little bit about music. What do you do? And they go, well, we're in a band. And he says, oh, that's great, where do you gig? And the guy says, oh, we don't, we don't gig. We're not good enough to gig, we're just a band. We're, we, we're not good enough to be live. Joy Ramon said to him, if you wait until you're good enough, you'll never play a show. And as legend has it, about two weeks later, The Clash played their first show ever, and that was these kids. And such a cool story, this band that became iconic, and they just needed, somebody was going to give it to them. It just happened to be Joey on this day. They just needed a kick in the ass. They said, stop. You're up there doing it, man. You're creating this stuff. Don't get caught up if you think it's good or bad. Keep creating and, and, and let other people judge for that. And I, I like to talk to, to, to writers about that a lot because I, I, I think I've had frustrations within the publishing business because I do think that it's so hard to break in. And they just look at new writers and, ah, you know what happens. It's like, 
I think I do have it. And, and, and I'm not going to let you tell me that, and I'm sure not going to say that about myself. If I put a book out and not a lot of people buy it, then maybe that says I didn't have it in that particular case. But I'll let them make that determination. So be your own champion in anything you create. And even if in the back of your mind, you know, eh, this is not really my best work. You created it, and it's out there. And be proud of it, because it's easy to sit and criticize, and it's easy for the, 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 the people on the side to go, ah, oh, not that, that way. I say, you know what? It's like the old story about people in, a, in, a, in an art museum looking at modern art. And they're like, well, I could have done that. And they're like, yeah, yeah, well, the point is he did, or she did. That artist did. You didn't do it, did you? That person did it, and they're hanging here in a, in a museum. So I, I, I hope this you know, can be some help to you, and I, I hope that, that you're, you're already inspired to do something. Not necessarily by me, but inspired by yourself, the great source. Uh, we got about 10 minutes. I'd love to take questions if you've got them. Jose. So when you self-publish, uh, how do you get editing? Some publishers provide editors. Right. Um, now, I'm not sure how it's going to be in the new world of Kindle publishing, which, again, they're just taking over CreateSpace. CreateSpace, I love them as a company. They have editors. I happen to know a guy in town who's an editor, and so I just hired him. The nice thing about almost all of these self-publishing things is they do it a la carte. So they'll say to you, do you want an editor? And you say, no. Well, okay, so because you have a friend, or you know somebody who can edit your stuff, and you're going to pay them. Uh, uh, do you want us to design your cover? No, you know what? I have a, a nephew who's an art and he's going to give me a good deal on this. Or, no, you know, I don't know anybody design a cover. Yeah, I need your help doing that. So it, it's like being at a buffet where you can pick and choose exactly what you want. So some of those Kindle self-published books, though, look like they didn't have an idea. That's exactly right. And, and that is because a person says, well, I don't want to pay the price you're charging for an editor. And I don't want to. The best writer in the world misuses words. This, you know, puts three words together that shouldn't be there. Uses, I can go back and I'll, I'll look at it. God, I used the same word four times in three paragraphs. What am I, an idiot here? You know, so you're right. Editing, do not skimp on that. Hire somebody who's good at it or hire somebody with the self-publisher. The ones that you've seen that don't look good, I almost guarantee you they're like, I just edited it myself. You can't edit your own writing because you just miss stuff. Anything else? Well, if you're self-publishing, you, know, you mentioned the social media marketing, but how do you how do you get your, your book into, into local store? Do you have yours as local? Great, great question. That's another negative to self-publishing. A lot of the big bookstores in particular will not do deals with Amazon because Amazon shaves their margin down too much. With my Sounders book, like most of the big bookstores wouldn't stock it. But what they did do, because I was selling them, they would let people order it. Uh, I don't know, you know, traditional brick and mortar bookstores how critical that is now because so many people just go online to do it. But, you know, one reason I chose CreateSpace because they were already owned by Amazon and now Amazon has folded them in was, you know, like them or not, Amazon's the biggest retailer in the world. I'm like, well, I might as well have my book there. That seems like a good place to have it. But that does bring up challenges. And what, one of the things I had to do, and I kind of liked this because I had the time and it allowed me to explore the business a little bit, I called independent bookstores and met with them and said, look, I, I'd like to do a deal with you. And they all wanted something a little different, but then, and some of them just ordered the book on their own. said, we'll, we'll take care of the business. And, but others said, no, we want you to order it, bring it in. So I'm, suddenly I'm a delivery boy and I'm, I'm bringing stuff. But I kind of I liked that aspect of it. I thought it was kind of fun and I got to meet a lot of interesting people. But you do have to do that. There's, there's more work involved. I was in a great place. It was the only thing I was doing that year. I had that luxury. Most of us are, you know, you're doing other things and trying to do it. I, I took a whole year off to do this book just to see what it would be like. So I had that luxury. But um, it's another plus in the publishing side. You don't have to worry about the distribution end of it. In, in the self-publishing, yeah, you've got to cut deals with bookstores. And you'll find out, you know, again, I, I, uh, like Costco. I'm, 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 at a, I'm at a concert at Shadow St. Michelle one night, and the guy said, you need to meet this woman. She runs the book division at Costco. I'm like, this is crack. It has just fallen into my lap, and my book had just come out. And I go over, and I tell her about the book. She says, that's fabulous. We love it. You want to do a big display? I said, fantastic. She goes, well, who's your publisher? And I go, well, I, I self-published through CreateSpace. She goes, our conversation's over. Costco will not do business with Amazon. You know, somebody pissed somebody off at some country club a while back, and I'm paying the price for it, you know? <laughs> so that does then come up. Those are headaches that you will hit, and you just have to 
you know, I made a choice. Well, what am I going to do anything different? So, and that stuff can change too. And I had, I forget which bookstore it was. Maybe it was third place. Third place was pretty good. There was some bookstore that originally told me, no way, we won't deal with Amazon. And then they got back and said, you know what, your book's actually selling. We've had some people come in, so we'd like to get 50 copies of it and see where it goes. And for them, it's, it's as much as just getting people in the store because they don't, you know, it's the book business, the margins are thin. It's a lot like the music business that way. Anything else? Any other? How about reviewers? Reviewers? Uh, with, uh, you know, again, with a publisher, they will send it out and get it reviewed. Self-publishing allows you to buy what's called a Kirkus review. Kirkus is a literary website that reviews books, and it's, it's not very much. They don't charge you very much. And the nice thing about buying a Kirkus review for your book is they allow you to decide if it goes public. So if Kirkus reviews your book and says, this is crap, it's drivel, you're out the whatever, what it was, like 20 bucks or whatever. You're out the 20 bucks to have them do the review, but you can say, no, I don't want this to be made public. And, and it's, and now I got lucky, they actually liked my book. The other thing that you do with reviews is, uh, and again, I was able to, to kind of chart people on, when I would see somebody on social media comment on, hey, I like Mike Gaston's new book, I would then friend them, direct message them, and say, would you do me a favor? Would you please go to Amazon and write a review for my book? And there's, if you go to my book on Amazon, the soccer book, there's like 55 reviews for it. And most of them are good. There's a couple bad ones, but that's okay. That then, when my book was hot in 2013 and 2014, those reviews tended to push it up in search engines and push it up on Amazon. So, it, you know, you want to be careful. If you ask friends to do that, please don't, you know, I always tell them, don't say, Mike is my good friend. You know, I, I want people to think this is all generic. And 98% of mine was. It was just people that said, I like the book, and I would contact and say, if you'd be so kind as to write a review for me. Again, that gets back to you have to be your own marketer. And to do that, you got to believe in what you're doing. So what about, what about uh, on that same note, you, you know, maybe you get somebody that reaches out to you, and uh, maybe they're a soccer business or soccer social media site and they have X amount of followers and say, hey, if you send me review books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they say you send us a book and then we'll give you, we'll review it on our end and yeah. like that. Is, that happened a lot. Do you avoid that? Do you push no. that? Do you just I, 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 I did everything I could possibly do. I just decided look I'm I'm fishing with a wide net here. And and soccer especially is an interesting sport because it isn't covered as much in the mainstream media. So a lot of the media that covers it is blogs, uh, uh, podcasts, this kind of thing. And I have people reach out to me and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I, I, I like your book, would you come on my podcast? I wouldn't even ask them how many people download their podcast. I said, yeah, of course I've got time to talk to you. And so yeah, I, I had no trouble with any of that. I, I did a podcast with a guy one night. I forget where he was located. But I finally, I've never done this. We had been going for almost 90 minutes and I finally said, I gotta stop, I, I, I don't have anything else. And I think it was just me and this guy talking. I think it was just that confident. He just wanted to talk about it. And I said, yeah, we're, we're done here. I got nothing else to say to you. So, but in, in terms of marketing, I, I was, and I keep using music analogies, but I always bought into the analogy. You know, the, the, the good bands will almost all tell you that they had a gig in their life where they showed up and there was nobody there. I go, like, you know, the key to that is you treat it like it's Madison Square Garden. There's three people there. You treat it like it's the biggest show of your life because it's the biggest night of their life. You know, that's how you get to be good at something. You treat big and small the same way, and, and, and that allows you, I think, to build success with it. And if I could do my soccer book again, yeah, I know so much more now that I didn't know, obviously, the first time you go through it. And my wife would tell you that I should tell you that you should have a second book in mind when your first one gets done. Because I got done, I'm like, I'm burned out. You know, it's funny, our bills are still coming. <laughs> I'd like you to come up with another book idea. But you do kind of have to wait till something speaks to you. Yeah, I'm currently working on a book that pretty much needed to be ready before our season starts. I'm a broadcaster for a team. It's our 20th season coming out. What was she? You want to add Apple Sox? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah, Apple Sox. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's. I think my biggest thing I'm worried about is when I need to get it out. Mm -hmm. and when I need to be completely finished and setting it over. Are you thinking of self publishing then? Yeah, that's no, right. Uh, the great thing about self publishing is, not anymore, I mean, I think for my book in 2013, they needed about a, a three weeks to a month. Now, I, I talked to him recently and said, now I'm like 10 days now. Really? Yeah. Now, you got to have it done. It's got to be edited, yeah, yeah, clean, really? 
format it. A lot of these sites don't format anymore, so you may have to pay. You may have to go to a company that does, you know, that, that specializes this and give them, I, you know, I don't know what they'll charge you, and say, I want this formatted so it looks good. To your point, you, you want it to look like a book. You don't want the pages to be out of order or something like that. Shit, that, that's no good. We want to make this thing look like Random House did it, and there's a way to do that. But if you can have it done and edit it, and, and, and whatever, when, when does your season start? It starts in June. So you want to have it out right before then, Memorial Day, let's say. Um, so I would get, if, if I were you, I would back it, back it up and I would say, okay, I want this thing ready to publish by April 30th. And we built it a little, and that means I got to have it done by about March 30th, which still gives you enough time, but it, it's amazing how quick they can turn it around. Do, do this uh, self-publishing uh, software, does it allow multi-polyphos to use of the text? Like, you know, for instance, for, for this book project, mm -hmm. we'd love to take the material that it's creating and use it for uh, web pages. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and other ways of doing this tradition. Yeah, uh, you'll, you'll have to do it. You'll have to pull out whatever file you got to put it out there. But yeah, you own the, my books are copyright me. I own I own every single word that's in that book. I can use it now. What I what I'd have to negotiate is, let's say your book becomes the biggest seller ever, and a publisher comes in. Now you're in some trouble because they say, no, 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 you can't do a deal. Well, a publisher wants to give you, you know, fifty thousand dollars for the Apple Sox. Uh, You've committed us, so we got to. But in terms of the, you own the copyright, and again, that's another cost within everything. It's all built in. It wasn't unreasonable. I, I, you get into it. It's not that much get done. And yeah, you'll own it. You can use it on your team website. You can release it that way. Have you used your books? In all yeah, things? yeah. Like I, I, I uh, Sports Illustrated actually uh, excerpted my book in four different uh, online issues. Nice. So I was able to give them, and they let me pick, which is really nice. But yeah, no, you own. The so words. Go, to town newspaper go to the town paper and they could excerpt it for you. No, absolutely. And and what the self-publisher likes that is because in there you'll just say, hey, I'd like you to please put how they can get the book. And you go to the team store, they go to the website, whatever, to get the actual book. And I'll self publish like, oh good, I'm making a little extra money on everybody who buys this. When you um you're acknowledging, like say at you know, the end, it's not necessarily your citation, it's the same thing in the paper. Right. You know, but when you're acknowledging the sources people you talk to, you use their stories, you, know, you may not have quoted them, but it's mm -hmm. when you're saying that I got the information. Do you need to say specifically what you got from them? Or do you need to just say you know, like special thanks to? I, I, I think, I don't know if there's necessarily a rule. Uh, I think your special thank you. This, this book would, like my book, the, uh, Mr. Townsend of the Polish Prince is going to list about nine different sports writers who I took stuff from. Now, in the book, I acknowledge them each a couple of times. Okay. As Dave Smith told Jack Chislack of the Wilmington paper, blah, 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 blah. Then the next quote I might use, I might not acknowledge Jack. But then at the end, the acknowledge the figure, hey, this book wouldn't have been possible without the reporting of this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and this okay. guy. So yeah, however you want to word that. Uh, but you, I don't think you have to specifically. I wasn't sure. It's a lot of mine for the folks who are story based. Mm -hmm. So I don't right. think it's heavy on what they're Right, right. So. And you'll be quoting them. Right? Yeah, so that's kind of the acknowledgement. Gotcha. You know, the, 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 the Apple Sox had this great game, da da da. Said manager Joe Blow or whoever it is you're quoting. That, that, so there's their attribution as well. Okay. Yeah. And you, you, you're never going to be hurt by over thanking the people who helped you along the way. Because again, it's another truism about this. People love seeing their names in print. Yeah. They're like, ooh, this is, you know, I've worked in radio my whole life. I'm real proud of what I did. Nobody gives a crap that I talk to them on the radio. Nobody calls this guy, I have a tape of that. Quote a person and put it somewhere like, oh my God, that's my name right there, you know. So, so people dig that, and, and as long as you're generous in that, and, and and you make sure, and that that's important, keeping notes along the way of the people who helped you and, and, and making sure they all get back. Okay. Good luck with the project. Thank you. All right, anything else, or can I take the I got to take the train back to the island to feed the dog.